My name is Keith Kramer, and I'm a partner in Kramer's Posey Patch. We're in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, and we are a 50-acre cut flower farm. We specialize in mainly specialty cuts, where we sell dried flowers, and we sell fresh flowers. We also sell seeds. We have a few other ventures that we work on. I'm third generation flower grower. We've been doing this for a while. My grandparents uh, began flower growing in 1965, and uh, since then, been a lot of changes to how we do things. Uh, my grandfather was a small acreage tobacco grower uh, as a sideline business, and he was also a carpenter. My grandmother grew garden plants and things like that, and she would cut the flowers and dry them and sell them to people at uh, Central Market in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And my grandfather thought he knew better, and he used to like to tease my grandmother about how much uh, money she was making on this small venture. And uh, she got fed up with it and started keeping track of numbers. And once he realized the margins that were available when you're dealing with cut flowers, uh, he quickly changed his tune. And the next year, they were finished with tobacco and started growing flowers uh, as a sideline business. The idea of season extension has always appealed to us, both in uh, the dried market and the fresh market, more so with the fresh. The dried market, we were uh, tired, as most growers are, of getting one single frost and having that wipe out everything in the field and then as soon as that frost is finished you have warm weather for the next three weeks. So it was frustrating that everything had to be done before that one frost. We thought that a structure would probably save us the problems of uh, worrying about that one night when the temperature dropped too low. Five or six years ago my father traveled to California to visit some west coast growers to see how they did things out there and that's when uh, he got his first look at a multiple bay tunnel structure. Uh, basically a high tunnel meant to cover multiple acres. When he came back from the uh, trip to California, we decided that we could build our own tunnels having seen the design that they used in California. Uh, we successfully put together and welded quite a few legs and got it set up and we had an eighth of an acre covered and the first time the wind speed they approached uh, 15, 20 miles an hour, the whole structure came down. So we learned quickly that there's more to it than just mimicking what someone else is building. Um, it was about the time that that was blowing down that he was traveling again, this time in uh, Europe, visiting uh, seed trialers in Europe, that he came across an advertisement for the Haygrove Company and uh, saw what they were doing in the multiple bay high tunnels. And that's what led us to the, the purchase that year of uh, our first acre, or our only acre of multiple bay tunnels right now. So this is our Haygrove tunnel. Uh, we have a structure that consists of six 24-foot bays 24 foot being the width. The total length of the structure is 300 feet. Uh, clearance in here is about 12, 12 and a half feet at the peak. And uh, right now it is what we would consider vented for the summer. We have the plastic rolled towards the inside so it sheds water off the outside of the structure without creating balloons or full bags of water in here. This particular bay is Crested Celosia. We have two of these bays in the Crested Celosia. We decided to grow this one last year and this year. Uh, so this is the second year we've done this crop in here. By using the high tunnels, I can gain five weeks earliness with my coxcomb as compared to my outside grown crops. And uh, I don't know why it took so long to dawn on me that I should be doing this crop in here, but this has made us a lot of money. It's, uh, it loves the environment, we get good stem height. And generally right now outside, the plants are much shorter, just starting to put some blooms in and uh, not near harvest. We're probably two weeks away from harvest and we have been harvesting in here for the past two weeks. So that's right on schedule. Usually we expect four to five weeks earliness on this crop. In this tunnel we have Asclepius in the outside beds and we have Lysianthus in the center beds. Uh, you'll notice in this tunnel we have shade net over top and the idea being that by cutting down on the light we stretch the stems on the Lysianthus which tend to be a short stem crop. They're much more saleable if they have nice long stems like these. The, when we tried to grow Lysianthus outside, we ended up with somewhere in the range of six to ten inch stems. And you can see by doing it in the tunnels, we've been able to come up to right around three feet is where we're getting with our stem length at some of the taller varieties. This one's still probably about 28 inches on some of the shorter varieties. The Asclepius on the outside is not really, it doesn't need the shade, but we've been growing it in here because we needed a place to put it. It wasn't a specific plan. Um, the Lysianthus we also grow on white plastic instead of the traditional black that we normally use. This helps keep the roots cooler, helps keep things uh, during its growth period. It likes to have nice cool temperatures and it adds to the stem length the cooler you can keep the roots. This is our hydrangea tunnel. This is uh, one of the directions we've chosen to go. 
We've started growing some hydrangea in the field and realized that it's a real high money crop. So we thought we would try it in the tunnels, gain a bit of earliness, and also get a nice quality product. Sometimes with hydrangea, you get petal burn when there's dew on the petals in the morning and you get direct sunlight onto the petals. It can make small marks on the petals and, and basically devalue the stems. Right now, uh, because there will be no rain hitting these and also condensation is not really too much of a concern inside the tunnels, we're getting very nice clean heads. And uh, these are first year, this is uh, Paniculatum grandiflora and this is uh, transplanted last August. So this is its first year of production really. And getting some really nice stem length out of these things. We've uh, changed our, our approach to growing in here with the, this being a perennial instead of four flat beds laid with plastic. We've shaped three raised beds in the tunnel, covered it wall to wall with the black ground fabric to keep the weeds down for the coming years and transplanted down through that onto these raised beds. When we first bought our high tunnel, one of the biggest lessons I had to learn was about temperature management. When we started out, I had an idea in my head that we would want the temperature to be somewhere in the mid 80s for ideal growing conditions. And I thought we would constantly be opening and closing the tunnels to maintain that temperature. Uh, as it turns out, what I should have been looking at was coming up with a, a high and low temperature that were acceptable. This is eventually where we came to. Uh, I placed recording thermometers in each one of the bays of our tunnels for the first year that we had it to kind of gain an understanding of how fast the tunnel heated, how much protection it gave us overnight and things like that. So as we learned more about the tunnels, I basically said, you know, I don't want it to go over 90 degrees during the daytime if it can be avoided. And I don't want it to go below 55 degrees in the evening if we can be avoided. So once my crew learned some of that, uh, venting became more of an automatic thing. And now in our fourth season, I give very little thought to temperature control at all because my team has learned where I want the temperature in those tunnels. As far as quality is concerned for the cut flower business, generally there is no such thing as a number two grade flower. Everything is number one or it goes onto the compost heap. So quality improvement was not necessarily something that we were shooting for because obviously we had figured out how to get a number one flower from the field. Uh, earliness was the big push. Uh, disease pressures have been reduced quite a bit. Uh, wet season diseases in general are non-existent inside a high tunnel. Dry season pests can be a bit more of an issue. Uh, we need to maintain good observation on spider mites and aphids are two particular pests that can be a problem. Powdery mildew can be a problem as well, but uh, for the most part, we've had good experiences. We've drastically reduced how many sprays we do as compared to the field. Um, the growing environment on its own is uh, greatly modified early on in the season. Once we get the tunnels to the warm part of the season, we vent and keep it vented for the duration of the season. It offers a lot of protection from heavy rains and in the rare event of hail, which we definitely don't like to talk about hail at all, but we feel that the tunnels would provide some pretty substantial protection against hail because with cut flowers, even one blemish, the whole, the whole stem is ruined. With any investment, you want to know how fast things are going to pay back, and it was a big question in our minds how long it would take for these tunnels to pay for themselves. And from the loose figuring that we did in the first years, uh, we had come down to the fact that the tunnels had paid for themselves generally after two and a half to three seasons with our cut flowers. Um, there are other crops that pay back faster, but we felt that we were very satisfied with that because from this point forward, all the investment is paid, so now it's, it's profit. My name's Ed Weaver, and uh, we're in Berks County, Pennsylvania here. And my grandparents started this orchard back in the early 30s, and over the years have uh, been becoming more diversified. We're growing mostly fruits here on our farm, and uh, the uh, tree fruits make up a large portion of it. We're also growing a uh, number of berries, including strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. And um, I am the third generation. 
And I also have uh, my children, four children and, and wife that are working with me. And we really enjoy working on this family farm. Cherries have become one of the crops that I really enjoy growing and yet there were so many risks. There's three major risks to cherries that we've seen here. And the first one is early in the spring with the, uh, the, the frost when, when the cherries are blooming. And uh, the, the second, second main risk would be, uh, would be rains prior to harvest, within, especially within the last couple of weeks prior to harvest, you get a heavy rain and you can lose the whole crop to cracking. The third big risk is birds and we were experiencing at least 50% uh, loss on the average and we decided that if we're going to grow sweet, grow sweet cherries we, uh, we need to find a way to protect them and so we decided to try the hay grove high tunnels on our sweet cherries to, uh, to protect them from um, numerous risks. We wanted to uh, test it out first on some, an existing planting and so we had this, um, at that time, a four-year-old block of, of cherries, which are in this bay here. And uh, we said, hey, how about if we uh, try it on, on these here? They're, they're producing, they should be producing cherries right now, and, and let's uh, put a tunnel right here. Well, it did create a little bit of a challenge in working around the trees, but in being able to put it over an existing crop, we're able to see right away that year the benefits of the high tunnel. And the, the first year that we had it, we did have uh, uh, a crop in most of this high tunnel on these cherry trees, but we lost a lot of the cherries outside the tunnel due to, uh, I think it was about a four inch rain within a few days of harvest that just split the cherries wide open. And we lost a lot of our early cherries that year outside the tunnel, or I should say a majority of them that were outside the tunnel. Inside the tunnel, less than 5% cracking. And that was just to the moisture that was in the area and, and maybe some around some of the edges that got a little bit of moisture from the rain blowing in. We have seen that within the, with inside the tunnels, the trees do have a little more vigor. They're, the temperatures inside the tunnel are a little bit higher and so we get a few more uh, heat units in there and get a little bit more growth but we've also realized that it's an environment that uh, protects the tree it's not under as much stress and for that reason then the tree grows more we've seen a number of other benefits also we're, let, we're able to allow the cherries to reach optimum maturity and with that optimum maturity we have a higher a higher quality cherry that will have a longer shelf life has a higher sugar level and our customers are are much more pleased with it in the spring if we put the the poly on the high tunnel early we can get an earlier bloom date and then with that earlier bloom date we're also able to get an earlier harvest date so we're able to bring those cherries into, into harvest at a time when the value of them is higher. And um, we always, always like the, uh, the highest price that we can get for our cherries. It's certainly appreciated. In the 50s, we started with uh, Pick Your Own Strawberries, and that continued real well through the 70s and in the early 80s, and then we began to expand into other uh, crops that we grew and started to open up the uh, the other crops for pick your own and so currently we uh, we begin in early June with uh, pick your own strawberries and continue right through October with various crops including uh, blueberries raspberries of course cherries uh, peaches and uh, pears apples pumpkins a uh, number of others Customers can come and, and pick our fruits uh, under the high tunnels, even if it's raining. And it's only taken them a year or two to learn that, and we're getting a lot of response even on a, on a rainy day. People will come out and, and, and do pick your own underneath the tunnels, and, and they love it. You know, what, what a great thing to do uh, on a rainy day. They can still go and, and pick, 
pick fruit. The customer is able to come to the farm and they're, they know that they're going to be able to, to pick a good quality cherry, where in previous years they might be sorting through cracked cherries that have begun to decay and it just becomes a frustrating experience. And they're even willing to pay a higher price for our cherries because they know that they're going to have a good quality cherry. We did find that there's some challenges, unexpected challenges with the high tunnels. One of the first challenges that we found was when we went to drill the legs into the ground, uh, whenever we hit a rock we ran a little bit of a problem, but that was overcome with using a jackhammer, drilling a pilot hole. We are able to, uh, to get the leg in and we won't have to worry about it coming out. One of the challenges uh, in, in constructing the, the hoops is uh, just the, the fact that you need to get off the ground up into the air there. So we had used a variety of, uh, of platforms that we work off of on, on top of wagons or trailers. And uh, with the use of ladders, we're able to get up there and, and do the construction. There are a lot of variables when we talk about the cost of a structure like this. And for myself, what I like to look at as a grower is what am I gaining and what is the value with that gain. And just, just roughly, if I look at that it costs me about $3,500 per year to, to have this structure, and that includes the cost of the structure, that includes the, the skinning and unskinning each year, the, the venting that needs to be done throughout the year. So it costs me $3,500 a year to have the tunnel. Then can I gain enough of value from that with this crop to, to justify that cost? And with the sweet cherries especially, we, we, have, we feel that we, we can get enough gain there uh, with the sweet cherry crop. I'm Steve Groff from Cedar Meadow Farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I'm the third generation on this farm, and uh, the crops we grow are mainly vegetables, tomatoes, sweet corn, pumpkins, and winter squash. We also have a few uh, other crops like corn, soybeans, alfalfa, hay. But the primary focus on this farm is the vegetables. I grow my crops using a permanent cover cropping system which is no tillage, cover crops, and crop rotation. And in that way, I've been able to uh, save the soil from eroding away, and I reduce my pesticides, and the water's cleaner. And it's just been a, a way that I can grow my crops, especially the vegetables, in a way that's minimal impact to the environment. I uh, had heard uh, Otho Wells give a presentation about high tunnels. And it was something that I thought, well, that might be a way that I can get my tomatoes earlier. So I erected a 15 by 96 foot high tunnel and grew tomatoes in there for seven years. And I really got to experience the benefits that high tunnels have to offer. The attractive thing in going with the Haygrove high tunnel was on the cost per square foot basis, it was a lot lower compared to the traditional smaller high tunnels. And being able to have a larger structure uh, was worked well into my plan because I wanted to have at least an acre of tomatoes in a high tunnel. Uh, I have six bays of tomatoes that are 300 feet long and 24 feet wide and then I just recently put up a one more bay for raspberries that I'm gonna see how they do in a high tunnel. Location is important when deciding where to put up a multi-bay high tunnel. Uh, one of the biggest considerations is uh, any wind protection that you can offer is an advantage because wind is probably the most uh, challenging aspect to consider. So I located uh, my tunnel on the one side is a woods and the other side is uh, somewhat uh, protected by a few trees. And then on the west side it's pretty well open so we really had to 
uh, put some extra anchors and supports there to protect against wind damage. We market our tomatoes to some local stores and restaurants and also uh, more significantly stores in the Philadelphia region and uh, because we're able to start a little bit earlier and I think most importantly the quality that we're able to get out here is where the Haygrove high tunnel tomatoes give me a marketing advantage that uh, you can really see the difference in uh, how the tomatoes look and it's a great customer appeal. The multi-bay structure of the Haygrove high tunnel is not designed for snow load so the, the plastic is taken off during the winter. That also limits you to real early production in the spring if you're in an area where you might have a late snow. We plant the tomatoes about any time after the middle of April that the, the long-term forecast doesn't predict any cold weather. Uh, the tunnel will give a certain degree of frost protection, but uh, I don't like to take any chances that early in the season. The first six weeks, two months of planting, you have to actually almost have to babysit the tunnel. Uh, depending on the weather and so forth, you really got to uh, know what's going on. I, I look at the hourly forecasts every morning on the internet to determine wind direction and even when the sun is expecting to come out so I can plan how to vent the tunnel for that day. And then we close it up every evening. And uh, then when, as the season progresses, usually about by the middle of June when, it's, when, the, when the tomatoes are are fruiting up and the nighttime temperatures don't drop much below 60 degrees. We put the sides up and uh, roll them up in a more permanent fashion and they just stay open then all summer. I get bees in early on as soon as I see the first flower clusters. Uh, because the tunnel is pretty much closed up at that point, there is not much wind inside to pollinate the flowers, to shake the flowers. So uh, I use uh, bumblebees that aid in the pollination. And I feel it's, if nothing else, it's an insurance to try to get uh, better pollination and, and more of it. We've experienced good uh, yields and good quality in the high tunnels. And that's one of the attractive reasons to grow tomatoes in the high tunnels. And um, it's, I, it's just kind of a rule of thumb that you can probably expect maybe 20% higher yield year in and year out. But I think noticeably is the quality is better. It's a little hard since I don't keep exact numbers to determine the exact difference in quality, but we can see it every time when we're bringing tomatoes in from the high tunnel versus the field into the grading area because you can, you can just see the difference visually all the time. My name is Andy Jones, and I'm the farm manager at the Intervale Community Farm in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, we are a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Farm, with uh, almost 500 households. We've been around since 1990, uh, and are one of the oldest CSA farms in the northern part of New England, and the largest in the state of Vermont. We grow a wide variety of things from arugula to zucchini, we do around 20 acres of produce a year. Uh, all of that is distributed to the members on the farm. One of the advantages that we have is that we're located in the city limits of Burlington, which is the largest city in the state. Uh, though it's only 40,000 people, it still is that in the surrounding community, still a, a big market for us. There's a lot of people who are interested in buying local food and eating fresh produce. So we have a, a real advantage in being close to people. I got interested in high tunnels because I was looking for a way to extend the tomato season in Vermont without spending an arm and a leg to get into it. Um, the outdoor tomato season in Vermont in a, in a reasonably good summer, typically for us we would pick nice fruit for five to six weeks from about the beginning of August through uh, the middle of September. And we could sometimes have better fruit in late September and sometimes we'd get fruit in, in uh, 
late July and things like that. But if we were really talking about nice slicers that we didn't have to do all sorts of crazy things out in the field to, to nurse them along when there was ice in the ground, um, we were really looking at a fairly short season. And the more I talked around, and tomatoes are one of the top crops uh, that we found year after year on our member surveys from the membership. So in as much as we wanted to provide what people wanted in their CSA share, it was a natural uh, extension to try to figure out a way to produce tomatoes for a longer period of time. And they've really kept the quality of the fruit up throughout the whole summer uh, as well. Primarily, I think, early season it's nice to have the heat, but um, really most of the disease avoidance is, is a, a major thing. So instead of having a lot of blemished fruit that we're sorting out of the field tomatoes and things like that, we have a lot of cosmetically much nicer fruit for more of the season and overall much higher productivity off of each plant. We have uh, six tomato houses at this point, uh, four 14 by 96 foot houses and two 14 by 144. The two 14 by 144s have a higher sidewall by a foot or two than the other ones, uh, which has been really nice. Uh, I would certainly recommend to anybody if you're going to the trouble of putting them up, having a high, if, and you're going to grow tomatoes inside, a higher sidewall is really a nice thing. We've kind of worked into two different uh, styles of tomato management in those two things. In the lower tunnels, the 14 by 96 foot versions, we've really focused on, uh, in, in recent years, we've gone to staked basket weave culture because uh, it, it is nice the amount of time that we don't spend in there messing with the tomatoes. So we can, you know, put them in in the spring or the, the midsummer, depending on when we're, when we're getting them in the ground, go in there a few times, weave them a few times, prune them once, and then really get in there and just start picking and not really have to do a lot of weekly maintenance. The taller houses, because they have more headroom, We've been doing overhead trellising, which is what we started out doing in all the houses. Do overhead trellising, pruning to a single liter, and tomato clips. In that house, in those houses, that is a reasonable system because we have a little more headroom so we get better air circulation. We have a little more room for the plants on the two outside rows to develop. What we're aiming to do in order to provide the tomatoes over the course of the whole season and also to maintain the quality and fruit size and things like that we generally try to ha put half of the hoop houses into an early crop of tomatoes. Those usually go in the ground right around the end of April, beginning of May. Uh, this last year I finally invested in getting some backup heat in there, so we don't have the capacity to heat them on a regular basis, but at least now we can keep things from freezing out on us when, uh, when the temperatures are going to drop down low in uh, the early part of May. Um, so we've, we do about three or three and a half, four houses. Then, then we aim to have those fruit until, or to provide high quality fruit for the first four or so weeks of the season. Then we're hoping that by, you know, the second week of August or so, we're earnestly picking field tomatoes so that that first crop overlaps with the field tomatoes a little bit. They sort of peter out. We pick the field tomatoes for a while longer, and then by early September or, or the last week of August, we have a second crop of hoop houses, hoop house tomatoes that have gone in the ground, uh, I think about the third week of June, maybe the fourth week of June, third week of June. Those go in and hopefully don't mature until that end of August or early September slot. Ideally, at that point, the field tomatoes are, are starting to sunset, the quality is declining on those, and the hoop house tomatoes pick up and carry us through mid-October. Over the years I've been really happy with our high tunnels. Uh, you know, if I, I think if I was getting into it now I'd probably make the same choice to, to go ahead and go for it because it's been a fairly low upfront initial investment, it's been a low ongoing operating cost, and it's made a big difference in our tomato production, particularly now that we're diversifying into doing some of the greens in the winter. We're looking at being able to use the houses and part of the farm for you know, 10 or 11 months of the year instead of six or seven and that seems like a good investment. The economics of it for us are not so much that we're making this many more tomatoes at this cost per pound and we're selling those on the wholesale market and it, so it's, it's not as cut and dried as that but we certainly are 
not spending as much time doing unproductive work with tomatoes in the field because we have a lot more, we have a lot better return on our tomato crop in the hoop house. We have more productivity per plant, a lot fewer culls, and likewise, um, we have a whole winter share possibility that's kind of opened up to us as a result of having the high tunnels to use through the winter. So it's been a, a great thing for us and something that I would love to expand and have more space under plastic in the future. I'm Ty Zemelski, and this is David Zemelski, and together we run um, Starlight Gardens in Durham, Connecticut. Um, it's a certified organic uh, farm. We grow primarily uh, salad greens, uh, including lots and lots of arugula, and in the summer, tomatoes, and a couple other things like basil and pea tendrils. We started this business six years ago we were looking for something to be uh, a home-based business we've both worked in a few other careers but for many many years i've worked professionally as an artist and we have we were looking for something that was home-based so that um, i wouldn't be so isolated and so that we could uh, do something that was uh, more flexible and we're together more often now, um, I guess six seasons later, we have uh, five greenhouses. Four of them are 30 by 96, and one of them is 30 by 150. Uh, two of them, at the moment, more or less have minimal heat when we want it, um, although we haven't used that very much at all. Um, and the other two are... are Basically, there are three, or just high tunnels. The heated greenhouses are two layers of plastic with a blower that um, creates a cushion between the two and adds extra insulation. And we cover the greens with remay or row cover, whatever name you want to use for it. It's a you know gauzy type of cloth that looks a lot like uh, tobacco cloth. And so that creates a microenvironment that basically puts the soil temperature, uh, and we're, you know, we are in Connecticut, but it makes it as if we are in, say, southern New Jersey, you know, that kind of um, ad advantage. So that kind of warmth, uh, we can keep the seasons going longer. The other thing is that um, all the plants that we try to grow through the winter are very, Friend, they're they're friendly to the cold. For they will be able to withstand um, freezing and thawing. You know, when you go there and go in there in the morning, and all the plants look frozen. It looks like this is the end of the earth in terms of plants. But uh, when the when it gets warm, they they come right back to life. It's pretty. It's it's really neat that that happens like that. One of the tools that's really important for salad greens is, is the four and the six-point cedar, which puts a very dense line of, of whatever seed you're growing down on the soil, hopefully to drown out any kind of weeds that are growing if you're doing it correctly. This year, we, we have used a new tool that kind of looks like a grass catcher um, that has a, a blade on it that saws through the the row of of greens and throws it into the basket it's it's very nifty and if you've spent all the time that we've spent cutting it just by hand with a knife you'd realize this thing is really a powerful new tool one of the biggest advantages of the high tunnel is that our greens are available can be available um, 12 months of the year and Presently in Connecticut, there aren't a whole lot of people that are doing this kind of farming. So, depending on the customer that we have, we've, we have a very you know receptive 
bunch of restaurants and also individuals who are just really happy to have fresh, locally grown food um, at odd times of the year when they'd otherwise have to buy something from California. One of the things that's rewarding about doing this work is my relationship with people in the public and the chefs. You know, all the chefs, you know, we talk together every week. You know, I tell them what we have. They tell me what we want. And we, you know, kind of meet in the middle there about what, what's available. And um, it's, it's, you know, the chefs are really interesting people to work with. I'm really lucky to work with them. Seth Jacobs, and uh, this is Slack Hollow Farm. We've been here almost 25 years, and we're in eastern New York in Washington County, and we grow mixed vegetables at about a uh, scale of about 15 acres. Uh, we're doing the spinach because it's so incredibly winter hardy. It uh, nothing, no, n there's no low temperature that will kill it as, that we've that we've seen. Uh, this is a very low tech greenhouse. There's no supplemental heat. There's not even any air circulation, uh, no fans. So, but the, uh, and if it's 20 below out, it's probably 15, at least 15 below inside, but uh, the spinach will freeze up, but when it thaws out, it looks fine, as you can see here. It's been, it was frozen, uh, frozen when we came in this morning, and we've had uh, 11 degrees already here. Well, this house is used uh, for tomatoes in the, spr in the spring, some early, some early greens and then tomatoes for the early spring and a, whole, a, a long summer crop. And then the tomatoes come out in roughly the end of October, the end of September. And we try and get the spinach planted by the 1st of October. And a few days either side the 1st of October. This was planted one side uh, about September 27th and the other side maybe October 4th. And we get multiple cuttings. We're just we're just starting to cut on this side, and usually we get three cuttings before the season's over at the end of March. Uh, we'd been growing spinach for three or four years, and had been doing so well with it that a lot of other growers started doing it as well. And even though our market, our farmers market was expanding, we found there was a lot of competition. We we're also adding a full-time employee, and we're looking for a way to provide her with a living in the winter time. Uh, and so we put, when we went to build another house, we put up a, a larger house. It's 30 feet wide instead of 21. Uh, when we built the new house, we had uh, some different goals in mind, one of which was we wanted it more automated. We didn't want to have to run back and roll up the sides. So we put in automatic roll-ups and for that, we used a, a heavy, a heavy 25-year fabric, both for the end walls and for the roll-ups. And they're on a thermostat, and you can control them. In it's a multi-dimensional thermostat. You can control the the rate of roll-up and the interval between temperature sensings and so on. Uh, it also has large gable end vents, which are also automatic. There's times where we have trouble harvesting in here. If the if the greenhouse is frozen up, and sometimes you can get two or three inches of frozen ground in here, uh, even with a row cover. And at that point, until it thaws out, you can't harvest the spinach because it's quite wilted and uh, really doesn't look like anything of value at all. But so in our upper house, we decided to add uh, an underground heating system, uh, kind of a radiant floor heating system, and we used the standard radiant floor technology that's popular in the construction house construction trades now. And we buried pipes uh, 18 inches under, a foot apart, and we're, what we're hoping to do is, with a minimal uh, expense in fuel, just keep the soil from freezing. Uh, maybe, set, maybe try and run it about 38 degrees, 36 degrees, just keep it from freezing so that we can harvest all the time and we can grow things that are, there's a lot of greens that will take 20, 20 degrees but no lower. And so we wanted to add a different, a different mix and have spinach as well as another mix at the markets. 
the mescaline mix we're, we're, we hope to grow in addition to the spinach and is, uh, is pretty much whatever will grow in the winter. So it's, our, it, it's a mix of ingredients from our different summer mixes, but it doesn't include lettuce, which probably won't make it through the winter. So it's our, our mizuna, the kales, the mustards. We're trying uh, chard, red chard, golden chard, red beets, uh, green leaf beets, and uh, we're also trying arugula uh, for, for separate bunched arugula and growing ba uh, bok choy as well. This house is a, uh, compared to the new house, is very inexpensive. Probably went up for uh, a total cost of maybe six to eight thousand dollars. The upper house is a, a real substantial investment for us. It's about twenty five thousand dollars with the heating system. Over the course of a winter, we'll expect to harvest from this house about somewhere between 1,000, 1,500 pounds of spinach, wholesaling it if we need to, but primarily retailing it. Our prices run uh, pretty steady at $10 a pound now. Uh, we started out a few years ago selling for $7 a pound. It's up to 10 Some of the growers are charging 12 The marketing opportunities are what really got us into this. Uh, the farmers, the local farmers markets started doing winter markets, and that opened up a, uh, a lot of income, a lot of income potential. And we had a great location for uh, for an indoor an indoor site with a lot of natural light for winter marketing, and we started a farmers market there about four years ago, and it's been very steady growth. It's been very successful, and it opens up a lot of opportunities for growers that didn't exist before. We intend to keep planting and be selling right through April when the markets go back outdoors in May. So that'll enable us to hang onto our customers better. Uh, we won't have to regain our market share when we start up again in the spring. The winter markets uh, are a real opportunity to take your business in different directions. Uh, with, uh, with hiring a full-time employee, we now have we can win, we can market in the winter, but we don't have to be here ourselves. Our, our farm manager can handle the winter markets just as easily as we can. So we can travel in the winter. We can also think about scaling back in the summer or taking time off in the summer and earning more of our income in the winter. And I know several other growers are, are lo looking at it that way.